Welcome to Season 3 of the Australian Naval History video and podcast series, produced in partnership with the Naval Institute, the Naval Historical Society, Navy Sea Power Centre and the Submarine Institute. Thanks for joining us. For more information on this series, please visit the UNSW Canberra Naval Studies Group website. To find us, simply Google Navy Studies Group and UNSW Canberra. Ours will be the first website in the search results. We hope you enjoy this podcast and return for others in the series. I'm Greg Swindon, Senior Naval Historical Officer at the Sea Power Centre Australia. On the 4th of October 1913, a modern and new Australian fleet led by the battle cruiser HMAS Australia entered Sydney Harbour to a tumultuous welcome. Less than a year later, the nation and her navy was at war. The timing of these events was described by Rear Admiral Henry Feeks in his book White Ensign Southern Cross as a miraculous exhibition of timing which surely must have seen the hand of providence. That Australia found itself armed and well prepared for war, in fact the existence of an efficient and effective Australian fleet in 1914 had been the result of years of hard work by a handful of British and Australian naval officers and politicians and countless hours of meticulous planning by the small staff of Navy Office in Melbourne. This episode discusses the formation of the Royal Australian Navy. To understand this fascinating story of the creation of the Australian Navy, I'm joined from Hamburg in Germany by Lieutenant Tim Dobler, a serving officer of the Federal German Navy, whose master's thesis was about the foundation of the Royal Australian Navy and it examines some detail of the colonial and imperial conferences. I'm also joined by Rear Admiral James Goldrick, who has written extensively on Australian and British naval history. His latest book, After Jutland, will be published later this year. And finally, Dr David Stevens, who has also written extensively on Australia's Navy, most recently in his award-winning book on the RAN and World War I, In All Respects Ready. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Good morning. James, I'll get you to lead off. Um, it's not widely known that Prior to the RAN being created, most of the Australian colonies had their own navies. How did, how did this come about? It came about because as the 19th century wore on, the Australian colonies increasingly felt that there was a threat of European powers if they went to war with Britain, sending forces to attack Australia. Uh, Russia was the uh, particular perceived threat. And the colonies felt that the British attitude did not necessarily extend to providing the sure defence of their ports and their uh, localities uh, that the colonies wanted. Uh, so with some Admiralty help, although the British Admiralty was always dubious about local forces, uh, a number of the colonies starting effectively in the 1860s but really uh, around about 1880 was the crescendo of the effort, established local defence forces to provide for defence within territorial waters and around the ports uh, of the coast and to some extent of Australian shipping. Mm. And I think Victoria may have taken the lead in, in some of those activities. Victoria took the effective lead and indeed uh, in the form of Cerberus enjoyed the most support um, because that was substantially paid for by, by Britain uh, in 1870. Uh, and assembled uh, by the early 1880s quite an effective force for the time. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Queensland um, assembled a force around a couple of gunboats, uh, which as a coastal defence force was quite adequate. And South Australia invested in what was the most capable seagoing vessel, which was the uh, cruiser protector, uh, which of course later saw service in China. Yeah. Tim, uh, in your studies that you've done recently, uh, You've looked at the, how the Royal Navy uh, interacted in, the, in Australia. Uh, what sort of naval protection was the Royal Navy actually giving to the colonies and to Australia in its early days? Um, as you may know, uh, by the end of the British, uh, by the end of the 19th century, Britain had uh, acquired uh, the largest colonial empire in history and executed uh, naval supremacy in all parts of the world. Um, and the Royal Navy was uh, the main tool to maintain this status and to protect uh, the colonies in uh, the merchant trade and the, uh, its lines of communication. Um, for the endurance of uh, the ships, 
uh, of the Navy. Um, the Admiralty established a naval stations, naval stations with uh, bases um, all over the world to uh, replenish the ships with supplies and ma uh, men to crew the ships. Uh, one of these bases was located in Sydney Harbour, from where the ships uh, of the so-called Australia Station secured the uh, area around Australia and uh, New Zealand. Uh, due to exceptional uh, changes in shipbuilding, the massive increase of costs connected uh, with the ma maintenance uh, of up-to-date uh, ships in all stations became almost impossible for uh, the Royal Navy. And therefore, the Admiralty and uh, the Australian uh, and New Zealand colonies <clears throat> signed a naval agreement where the colonies agreed to pay subsidies to uh, the Royal Navy. Uh, and in return, the Royal Navy agreed to uh, maintain a suitable fleet of, uh, of, of ships or uh, warships in, the, uh, in these waters. And uh, by, uh, by the time of the Federation uh, of the Australian colonies, uh, there were about 16 uh, ships of the Royal Navy uh, in Australian waters, but most of them were obsolete and uh, yeah, out of date, so to speak. And um, the Australian public was very, uh, very upset about um, this... Um, yeah, about uh, this fact. All right. Thanks, Tim. Uh, David, I think at this point in time we get to uh, talk about William Creswell, William Rook Creswell, who is seen by many as the father of the Royal Australian Navy. And he has the, the honour of commanding two of the colonial uh, navies uh, during his time and then becoming the father of the RAN. How does this all come about? Well, Creswell is, <coughs> excuse me, Creswell is certainly a key figure in the founding of the Australian Navy. Um, he was born in the mid 19th century, uh, joined the Royal Navy as a cadet, and then spent some time um, coming out to Australia in 1869 and visiting the colonies for the first time and thought it was a wonderful country. He then did some other work around the um, periphery of the empire, anti-piracy, um, counter-slaving type operations. Um, but he um, decided to leave the Navy, uh, the Royal Navy, in the late 1860s because his promotion prospects were bad. And he, in fact, decided to come out to Australia and assist a brother um, with um, becoming a pastoralist. And he spent about eight or nine years around northern Australia, um, eventually failing um, to make his fortune on the land. Uh, but he... Um, during these last few years in Queensland, he'd been encouraged by an old shipmate to come to South Australia and become the um, second in command of, of Protector, the, the uh, gunboat they had there. And um, he eventually succumbed, uh, joined the South Australian Navy in um, 1885 at the age of, 80, of uh, 33. And um, that really started him thinking far more about what Australia needed in terms of, of um, defences, maritime defences, starting with the South Australian situation and then moving gradually to encompass the other um, colonies. And during that time, he advanced from being the com Commandant of um, the South Australian Navy to the Commandant of the Queensland Navy and then eventually the Victorian and the Queensland State Forces before um, assuming command of the um, the colonial naval forces um, early in the uh, 20th century. He was certainly uh, very much a, um, a writer. He, he, once he'd um, started on a, on, a, um, on a path, he didn't stop. He was writing letters and uh, articles in newspapers, doing all he could to push the line that Australia needed its own naval forces and couldn't just rely on subsidies to the British because there's always the danger that the Royal Navy would be required somewhere else mm -hmm. and Australia would be left unprotected. Mm -hmm. James, we've got uh, the Royal Navy providing the, the blue water protection, so to speak, of, of Australia uh, at the turn of the, uh, the 20th century uh, and the colonies are providing you know, coastal defence. Uh, and this sort of mismatch continued on after Federation for a number of years. So, how, how did that work? Uh, it didn't work very well because although people like Creswell were doing their best to keep the increasingly aged uh, 
former colonial vessels efficient in the new Commonwealth naval forces, um, it was quite clear that the British squadron was not particularly adequate. Uh, at that stage, the European threat was probably minimal. Australia itself was increasingly concerned by the potential Japanese threat, mm -hmm. which the British felt was um, always exaggerated and didn't exist after the Anglo-Japanese Treaty of 1902. Uh, but there are other factors. Um, Australia really didn't quite know what navy it wanted. Uh, the Commonwealth did not have full control over its revenues until a decade, until 10 years after uh, Federation itself, due to an agreement with the states uh, for the transition. Um, the Admiralty um, was doubtful about local naval forces um, and really felt that they, it was almost impossible to have local forces which could remain efficient uh, and also be under Admiralty control when necessary. And indeed there were some questions as to the legal status of Australian ships outside our territorial waters. Um, if they weren't acting under Admiralty control, what was their legal situation? Interesting. So, Tim, um, yes. we're starting to create the Australian Navy, but one of the major factors that's going on at this time is the number of colonial imperial conferences. Um, can you describe how they helped or in, potentially in some cases hindered the, the actual creation of an Australian Navy? Um, so the conferences actually helped to create an Australian Navy uh, because uh, even though the um, the the uh, Admiralty uh, didn't want uh, an Australian Navy by the um, by the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, they realized or they were quite clear about that the Australian Australian people would get their own navy one day. And um, at the first conference of uh, um, after Federation in 1902. Uh, they uh, they were asked by um, Andrew Fisher uh, if it's possible to to get an Australian Navy. He he was one of the politicians uh, back in Australia who, who tried to promote an Australian uh, Navy, uh, but uh, he was or his uh, request was rejected um, uh, by by the Admiralty, uh, and in order or. Um, as to compensate this uh, re re rejected request, they offered uh, another naval agreement <clears throat> where the Australians and the New Zealand governments would pay subsidies again. But uh, in, in addition to uh, this, uh, they would uh, receive um, colonial cadet ships to send boys over to Great Britain to get trained as um, as, as officers. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because um, if if you uh, uh, analyze the, the the proceedings of the um, uh, of the conferences, you can see that um, even though the Australian um, delegations always try to promote an, uh, an Australian uh, naval force, they were quite clear about. Um, the possibility uh, um, to to get one. So Andrew Fisher uh, um, realized that uh, it was just too expensive for Australia in 1902 to uh, get its own navy. And um, four years later, or five years later, in 1907, even the uh, the the Admiralty changed her attitude about uh, an Australian naval force they said uh, that it's possible to uh, to to get an australian navy but they wanted to control the ships and that was something that uh, deacon couldn't agree to so he rejected uh, this offer by the admiralty and um, left the uh, conference without any uh, new uh, uh, conclusions or new uh, achievements but inter interestingly uh, he came back to to this uh, to this offer of the Admiralty in a private letter to uh, Admiral Fisher where he wanted to agree to every term uh, that the British made uh, 
at the conference uh, just to get an Australian Navy. But um, the conference of 1909, 1909 uh, changed everything again uh, because of the adoption of the fleet unit concept. So uh, the um, conferences were uh, very important steps in the formation of the Royal Australian Navy. But um, as far as I can see, uh, they're not well known in the uh, current discourse. Thanks, Tim. Uh, David, Tim's mentioned Alfred Deakin, and I believe he was a significant figure in the actual creation of the RAN. Um, yes, exactly, Greg. Uh, you can't really talk about the creation of the RAN without Creswell and without Deakin. Um, Deakin was a Victorian. Um, he attended the 1887 conference as the Victorian representative. Um, he was a native born. He was a, a great orator and he was a journalist, a bit of everything. And he also was um, a bit like Creswell in that he realised that Australia was a maritime nation. And the only way it could advance was to protect, make, ensure that it could do its own protection for its maritime interests. We couldn't rely on someone else. And so he was quite against subsidies or tributes, as they called them sometimes. And um, as Deacon moved, um, he was a, a father of federation and became a member of um, the first parliament after, after federation and gradually um, even becoming acting prime minister during that, that first term. But he subsequently had three periods as prime minister on, on his own. Um, there were quite regular changes of government at that, mm -hmm. that, that stage. But it did mean that gradually he could push the ideas that he wanted, which was to have an independent Australian Navy where we didn't pay subsidies to the British, where we could run our own force. And he was a, a major figure in this. I believe at one stage he upset the uh, British by actually inviting the US Navy's Great White Fleet to visit Australia. True, and this is a, a, again another example of his independence, his own national spirit, in that he knew that the, um, the Americans were sending out their, their Great White Fleet on a world cruise and he independently invited them to Australia. And again it's part of his policy of trying to encourage Australians to think in a maritime way and see what a nation like the, the United States can do and maybe Australia can head in those dire that direction as well. James, so, so what really was the Royal Navy's major concern in not supporting an independent local navy for Australia? I think they had two legitimate concerns. One was the question of control. Um, the Royal Navy did think globally and was concerned uh, that in contingencies it could have access to all the naval forces available. And the subtext of that is they always knew they would end up having to support the local activity mm -hmm. to some, some degree. The second was the concern which was demonstrated by the experience of the colonial forces that the, nation, the local nation would not make the commitment necessary to maintain and sustain and renew an effective navy. Um, they always felt that there was a tendency for great enthusiasm, mm -hmm. for uh, a rapid burst of, of a burst of expenditure. Capital equipment is acquired, but then it's not renewed. It's not given the, they're not given enough money to exercise, to train, and they're so small that they cannot generate a proper career structure. And potentially, you know, the next 20 or 30 years prove them correct in some of those facets. Well, it did. I mean, the um, question of Australian government commitment, uh, which was fine until about 1920, uh, and then of course you get that progressive erosion. Um, the size of the force became a key problem after the First World War. Um, the career structures, everything else, and had the Royal Navy in fact not been providing a, a very great deal of backplane support, um, I think the Australian Navy would have become moribund. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Tim, um, after Federation, the, uh, the col colonial forces are amalgamated into what became known as the Commonwealth Naval Forces, or the CNF. Um, can you describe what the, the Commonwealth Naval Forces actually was? Uh, so the uh, um, the Commonwealth Naval Forces was an uh, combined navy of the former colonial formed of the colonial uh, former colonial navies. Uh, it was a relatively small navy with about 240 men, uh, officers and 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 men, and consisted of 
yeah, not more than 10 vessels like uh, the Victorian Cerberus, uh, the, the South, South Australian Protector and others. Uh, but the main problem was it was uh, inadequate, it was old even for training and protection. And another uh, big issue was that uh, even though the colonial naval forces came under federal control uh, in March 1901, uh, they uh, were ruled under, uh, they were still ruled under um, uh, colonial acts. So uh, there was no overall command. Um, and <clears throat> uh, there were four, uh, yeah, chief of navies or chief of naval staffs who uh, had to report to the minister of defense. Uh, and uh, it was not until uh, early ni 1904 that the Commonwealth uh, uh, Defense Act was um, adopted, uh, where the um, uh, where the director of naval forces was uh, created, the position of uh, uh, this uh, director was created, and Captain Cruzwell was uh, the first who um, who uh, became director of uh, naval forces. He was the first in command of overall command of the uh, Australian naval forces, and uh, this uh, force remained. In, in, in commission until uh, July 1911, uh, where it was renamed by the, uh, Brit uh, the British King George V uh, into Royal Australian Navy. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, David, uh, Tim's briefly described the, the CNF. So how did this hodgepodge uh, actually make it? What did Deakin and what did Creswell do to get it to become the RAN by 1911? Well, first of all, you need to know that they didn't always agree. Um, Deakin and Creswell were at, on occasion at loggerheads, despite both wanting the same objective in the end. And um, their ideas about force structure varied throughout, often based on talking to, you know, sending a, a mission off to the United Kingdom, where in fact Creswell went off on a, on a world tour at one stage um, to get any information. And because it was an er era of technological change, there was a lot of um, difficulty of knowing where to, to put your money as well. And certainly destroyers are often mentioned, although the destroyers in the early, uh, the early 21st century are certainly not the sort of destroyers you talk about today. But there was also talk of um, cruiser destroyers but yet it's not quite sure whether that is a destroyer of cruisers or a, some mid-ranging ship between a, a cruiser and a destroyer, because there was also, to, you know, destroyers are actually torpedo boat destroyers. So these sort of questions are happening, and then submarines are thrown in the mix as well, which gets really confusing. And so Creswell is very much someone who wants a navy that's going to provide escort for merchantmen to keep mm -hmm. Australia's sea lines of communication open and working. People like Deakin have got other ideas and they're thinking of, oh, we need something to a bit more harbour defence like. And um, Creswell talks about we need you know, a, a balanced force which can do some of the coastal work and a little bit offshore work and makes the point that Australia, as soon as you get off the heads, you're really in deep water open ocean sailing. And if you're going from east to west, you are open ocean, open ocean. Mm -hmm. it's not a coastal force. So Creswell's looking at that, so that sort of idea and particularly ships that have got the endurance, the sea keeping to get from one side of Australia to the other. Now uh, Deakin gets the idea when he's in England at one stage that submarines would be good for Australia and Creswell is very much against submarines at this early stage mainly because he's worried about that they're not technically mature, they haven't got the range, they haven't got the sea keeping and they're not really good for providing escort so why would Australia need them? And so this becomes a bit of a problem when Deakin announces his naval scheme in, in 1906 and 1907, where he makes a, a major speech in December 1907, where he says we need, Australia needs a, a minimum of militarism and a maximum of navalism. And um, he talks about needing a, both submarines and destroyers. Now Creswell calls this Deakin's silly naval scheme because there's no need for submarines, it's just a waste of money. So this is the sort of conflict you're getting um, in this period and there's no real concrete direction until in fact Deakin goes out of office, 
Andrew Fisher comes in and makes an announcement, we're going to get a flotilla of, um, of destroyers. And Creswell's quite supportive of that because it fits mm -hmm. in with his, his ideas. And that's really where we're getting to um, in 1909, which Tim briefly mentioned the conference. The beginning of 1909, Australia puts in the first order for those destroyers. Um, three to be built in England, the rest to be built in Australia. And in fact, one of those three in, built in England is to be dismantled and brought back and built again at Cockatiel Island to get our, our um, workers up to, up to scratch and shipbuilding skills. So it was never just about defence, it's also about infrastructure. Hmm. James, um, Admiral Jackie Fisher has been mentioned a couple of times previously, not to be confused with Prime Minister Fisher, two different people. But how does Fisher fit into the, into the scheme here? He appears to be, you know, he's, he's very British obviously because he's a Royal Navy Admiral, but he wants to be helpful to Australia in creating its own Navy. He also wants to help the Royal Navy and help Britain's strategic situation. Fisher does seem to have been quite an effective geostrategist and the fact, of course, he'd served all around the world, including in China, um, unlike Winston Churchill, who never got further east than India or further west than Los Angeles. And Fisher did understand there was a global commerce protection, global sea lines communication protection problem. Um, he also did feel that the dominions as they were becoming, these newly independent large states such as Australia and Canada, did have potential to r reduce the defensive burden on Britain, which was, started, which was becoming increasingly um, heavy with the arms race with Germany. Also, Fisher uh, was the progenitor of the battle cruiser, and the battle cruiser that he conceived was a global commerce protection ship extremely long range, very fast, very heavy guns, able to destroy anything that couldn't, uh, that, um, that floated, um, and to do so at very long range. So he does think that his brainchild fits the concept of the dominions contributing to a global system. Um, and he puts forward the battle cruiser as the core of what he describes as the fleet unit, mm -hmm. which will be a balanced force that will have supporting light cruisers and destroyers, and it will also have submarines which um, really parallel to the IT revolution in the present day have advanced tremendously even in two or three years. Um, so he proposes this package um, which Australia and in, he hopes other, other countries of the British Empire will create. And I think Britain actually assisted with the funding of the creation of that, that fleet unit as well. There is some financial support, um, but of course it's working in different directions. New Zealand um, has promised to pay for a battle for a capital ship, uh, mm -hmm. which yeah. becomes a battle cruiser. The intention is at this stage that that become the flagship of one of the three fleet units in the Far East. Um, but there is an expectation that Britain will help with the creation of the new Australian Navy. Uh, the British will hand over, effectively free of charge, all the existing British naval infrastructure uh, in Sydney, um, such as Garden Island Dockyard. Um, and they will support with uh, training and providing personnel to man the ships before sufficient Australians are trained. So there is a whole intent of helping. But it's quite clear Fisher does think that this is a way of relieving, in the long term, relieving the burden from the British. The financial burden. Yes. yes. Thanks. Tim, um, a Navy is more than just the uh, ships and, and sailors and um, the supporting infrastructure, which James has briefly mentioned there. Uh, the fleet unit's created, uh, but we also get Admiral uh, Sir Reginald Henderson coming out to Australia to do a comprehensive review of what our naval forces are and what they need to be. Um, can you elaborate on that, please? So Admiral Henderson uh, was invited to Australia to uh, and was asked to give advice on how the, Royal, uh, uh, the, the Australian Navy should assemble its infrastructure infrastructure uh, in, in Australia. So he made a comprehensive plan uh, to develop an Australian Navy in an infrastructure way. Uh, he expected that the Royal Australian Navy would expand uh, in the following decades and forecasted a, a fleet of eight battle cruisers 
10 light cruisers, 18 destroyers and several submarines and therefore he uh, planned to build uh, bases all over Australia, spread all, all over Australia and with this bases uh, he also planned to um, uh, establish dockyards and signal stations and lighthouses to um, get a even better uh, protection, naval protection for, for uh, the Australian people. Uh, but as history showed, uh, shows that um, this plan wa wasn't uh, finished because he uh, thought uh, it would uh, last until 1933 uh, when the uh, plan was finished with all the precautions uh, all the provisions that were made uh, for this big fleet of eight bat battle cruisers and over 15,000 personnel. Thanks, Tim. David, the Henderson report sounds like it was, uh, well, perhaps 100 years ahead of its time, but also fairly extravagant for a, a country such as Australia to afford. Do you care to comment on that? Yeah, the, um, the Henderson plan was very much um, a product of its time and the political um, situation at the time and um, the fact that it included at least one or two bases in every state gives you a, a, a hint to the problem um, in that we're, we're still trying to build an Australian spirit at this stage. The, um, st the separate state colonies or then became states are often described as separate islands or may well have been islands because they, they are just completely different. They don't have even internal communications. Everything's by sea. Um, so providing a base for each gives you an idea of, of what they're trying to achieve. It's get everybody on side and make sure everybody's supporting. Um, the, the Henderson plan though, it did have some, um, uh, you've got to remember Henderson was actually a, a dockyard admiral rather than a, a seagoing admiral. They'd originally wanted Admiral Fisher to come out and he couldn't make it. Now, that's not to say anything against Henderson, but it meant that he had a different mindset about what was required. And there sir, were, certainly were complaints made in Navy office that the, the Navy itself was being created for the purposes of its creation, not with any strategic um, understanding in mind, i.e. how it was going to be used, why you needed all these bases around and what the Navy, where, where it was going to be. I mean, one of the big things when you talked about him you know, being ahead of its time, obviously, was that he was in, wanted to have a west and east coast fleet, and hence bases on either coast, which makes a lot of sense to us today. But of course, at that period, we didn't have the money, and um, there was a lot of argument in, in Navy office about whether we should be wasting money building a completely new base in the west, rather than concentrating with our limited funds and resources on at least building up the east coast. So the Henderson plan was accepted. It was um, it, it's certainly a Navy office. They were working towards it, but not everyone would agree with how it was progressing. Okay, thanks. James, we've got <coughs> the fleet units being built. We've got a couple of destroyers. Creswell's in charge. Uh, what's he going to do to actually get this, this thing to become a going concern? Um, what was most important was that he had to work with the British um, because most of the effort about getting the fleet up and running was being was required in the United Kingdom and required Royal Navy support. Um, he did need to establish a capability in Australia and in terms of Navy office it's true that Creswell was ageing and tired mm -hmm. and experienced difficulties from the first uh, there were political difficulties in that the level of understanding in the government was quite limited. Um, the role of a minister in running a complex department and, uh, and a military service was not understood. I think he's very fortunate in that the Admiralty um, were very cooperative up until the time that Winston Churchill became First Lord of the Admiralty who had a different agenda. In the time of Fisher, uh, the Royal Navy gets what is needed and there is a strong effort to provide the ships, provide the men. Uh, for example, they clearly searched out the Australian-born officers um, 
to be in the units of the fleet unit uh, so that there will be this idea that as much as possible it's already a national capability. Uh, they will make sure there's the right equipment, that the ships are getting the right priority. And the example is the submarines in which the Admiralty goes out of its way to give AE1 and AE2 the priority in the queue for the new fit of radios to submarines. So British submarines fit is delayed in order that the Australian submarines have it before they come out. Um, the problem becomes Churchill, who has a very different view. Um, Churchill is intent on concentrating forces in British waters. Uh, he tries to keep the Australia uh, from deploying um, home. <laughs> Uh, he wants to keep it in the UK and there has to be considerable pushback within the Admiralty and from the local Commander-in-Chief, Sir George King Hall, um, to prevent, uh, to ensure that the um, Churchill isn't allowed to put so much pressure on the Australian Government that they feel there's no alternative. Uh, so there are all these things at play. Cresel works hard. Um, but there are significant personality difficulties in Navy office. I think uh, expertise is a key issue. Uh, there's some very talented people, but there's such a range of problems to deal with uh, that in many cases, um, they're only just keeping up. Thanks, James. I know we like to do a, quite a bit of British bashing here in, in Australia at times, but certainly it appears that, the, as you say, the Royal Navy was going out of its way to make sure that this worked and it was a going concern. And was there any thought that potentially if they make the Australian Navy work that uh, that would then have a flow on effect to some of the other dominions and colonies? There was no question. Um, the Australia was really taking a lead on this. The New Zealanders were willing but had far fewer resources. Um, Canada was very difficult. Um, the Canadian outlook was not maritime uh, to the Pacific um, in particular and certainly in defensive terms, not, not really maritime to the Atlantic. Uh, and Canada was seen as really needing to have a good example set. Tim, uh, looking at a German perspective here, uh, the RAN's been created. It's a, a significant fleet unit in the, in the southwest Pacific. Germany has colonies in, uh, in New Guinea and, uh, and in China. Um, do you have a, a perspective as how Berlin viewed the creation of the Royal Australian Navy? Uh, for for the Germans, uh, the Pacific uh, region was uh, uh, of high strategic and economical uh, interest, and um, the the Germans were um, excited to see how uh, the Australians, uh, how Australia would project itself uh, in the region as a as a united dominion as you want and um, interestingly they were looking for a breakup a kind of a breakup in relations between uh, Great Britain and Australia in that time of formation of the formation of the Royal Australian Navy and um, uh, another interesting point is that they totally underestimated uh, the Australian Navy once uh, the fleet unit arrived uh, Australia uh, because uh, the plan uh, the German war plan for the Pacific uh, was to uh, raid the, the, the trade uh, trade routes and to uh, disturb the um, cargo uh, the cargo ships between Australia and Europe well, uh, what, uh, uh, what would have been distresses for Great Britain. Um, and uh, Vice Admiral von Spee, who arrived uh, about the same time than uh, Australia arrived in Sydney, uh, he thought that um, the Australians wouldn't leave the Australian waters with uh, her, its ships once they're paid and manned by Australians. Uh, but um, he was proved wrong, as we uh, as we can see. <clears throat> Australia, uh, the, almost the whole Australian fleet unit was involved to uh, capture the German uh, colonies after the war broke uh, break out broke out, and um, after the outbreak of the war. And uh, he actually left the Pacific to uh, get back to Germany to um, uh, to. Uh, fight in the European waters than uh, fight 
his merchant uh, war. Thanks, Tim. David, uh, what was happening in Navy office at this point in time? You know, what was their view on the, how the RAN, this new fleet unit, was going to be used in a time of war? Yeah, well, this is where I was mentioned before, and that there was a concern that it wasn't there wasn't a strategy for its employment. And certainly, um, as James has mentioned, after Churchill gets in, the the push from um, that Fisher had, uh, Admiral Fisher had made to get the fleet units up and running died off completely. There was the the Australian fleet unit was the only one that was created, so the other two never appeared. One was supposed to be China, one was supposed to be East Indies Station. Um, now that meant that Australia was going to, was in danger of ending up with a fleet that had didn't have a role in the defence of Australia or the defence of the Pacific that they were expecting, and it would be isolated, and um, you know you'd lose that connection with the Royal Navy that everybody wanted for, for a whole range of reasons, technology and, and training, etc. So, uh, um, and again, it ties into the, t the Henderson plan about where these bases were going to go and, and what the, the fleet was being created for. And in 1913, a, uh, one of the um, uh, couple of members from, of Naval of Navy office and the, uh, the chief of army are sent off to northern Australia to, to check out one of the Henderson bases uh, that was going to be built in the uh, Torres Strait. And they really, the, the, this team decides that this is a waste of time. We shouldn't be building a fortress in, in the Torres Strait. That's not what we need. Um, and they gradually come to the idea that our, uh, our, um, our threat is to the north. And it makes sense to us today, but when you think that New South Wales and Victoria and South Australia and even Western Australia with, with Perth, their population centres were down the south. Mm -hmm. That's where the trade routes, routes were going. That's where the, they need, thought they needed to protect the shipping. So this group's going up to the north and saying, well, there's this huge empty space here. Um, what do we do if someone turns up and takes it from us? We can't do anything. Where, where is the enemy going to come from? And they start looking at a, at a maritime strategy, a whole of government uh, approach to how we should defend Australia. And they start looking at um, mobilising the army in the south, training it up to, to the north, moving our bases up to the north so we can, um, we can be ready if the, a, a foreign power comes down. And they designed it against the Japanese, but it could have been any power. And um, so we're basing um, our forces north and even putting a tripwire up um, such that uh, we have coast watchers on a line of islands to the north of us to detect wh where the fleet's coming from and which direction it's going and how many ships, all those sort of, that sort of information you need. So it's, it's quite an advanced um, integrated strategy. And um, you don't really see anything like that until the 1980s um, uh, in Australia of how we would defend, defend the, the nation. Um, so this is going on in, in at the same time as the fleet units coming. And there's, so there's one party in Navy officers that says, we need to throw out the Henderson report, forget the fleet unit um, program, and think about how we're going to do it ourselves with our own resources. And then you have the other part of Navy office led by Creswell who's saying, we've got this plan, we'll stick to it. And really that, that, um, that problem is never solved um, because the First World War breaks out, uh, but it, 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 it doesn't never really goes away. And in fact, when Admiral Jellicoe comes out after the, the First World War to look at Australian defences, he really picks up on that strategy that was left off in, in 1914. So there's a lot of thinking going on um, in Navy office about how the fleet is going to be used with or without the Royal Navy presence. So is the Navy almost a catalyst for increasing the nation building of Australia? Certainly in, in, um, in that sort of strategic sense about how Australia is going to be built, because they even talk about, um, you know, we need a, to build a rail line from south to north. So, you know, for def defence purposes, which we have only got to in the, in the last few years. But yes, the, the, the Navy itself is um, one of our original national institutions. And I mentioned before about the problem with the different states and how they tended to be separate islands. You, we need to look at the Navy as part of um, our nation building process about bringing the states together, about making them think in Australian terms, not just in state terms. And that goes across the board, including 
um, the infrastructure, including even things, simple things like the names of the ships. Why did they choose Australia for the flagship and the, uh, the, the light cruisers were named after the state capitals? All those sort of issues. Um, there's a curious parallel here which Tim uh, may want to comment on to the German effort. The Wilhelmine Navy, uh, the Navy of Tirpitz, was a great German national pro uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, very much the idea that this will cross state boundaries, this will bring Bav Bavaria and Prussia and all these other states together in one national effort. And really the Australian Navy uh, is, a, is almost our first great national project. Tim, would you care to comment on uh, what James has just mentioned there? Uh, yeah, the uh, comment that I want to make is uh, that um, uh, there are similarities, but uh, the the Turpitz Navy uh, didn't work very well. So uh, it was a was um, a waste of resources, more or less. So um, an, a navy in another form uh, probably. Uh, would have been better for the German purposes for for protection for the protection of the German territorial waters. So the Australian Navy worked uh, like, um, and the uh, German Navy just didn't. Thanks, David. Have you got any final thoughts on the on the creation of the Royal Australian Navy? I think that, that uh, final thought should be on the, the, the complexity and the, the way it reaches into all these different areas we've been talking about. It's not just a matter of getting ships and flying the flag. There's the whole thing about building up our technological capability, our local shipbuilding, our ability to um, support our own fleet. It's all thought about and it's all tried to be put into practice. And the, the situation at that level is complex, but even the individuals are complex. There is far more that we don't know yet, um, simply because we haven't looked back enough. And a lot of the things we've been saying, or I've been saying today, have been generalisations. And in fact, you'll find the same character saying completely different and opposite things at various times. Um, there's a lot more to learn. James, any last thoughts? I'd really back up David's point navies are complex, they're hard, and they require sustained effort and sustained commitment. And I think the lesson of the first quarter century of the Australian Navy's existence to incorporate the war and what follows is if you lose that recognition that it needs to be a sustained effort, uh, you're soon in trouble. So Tim, before we go, have you got any final comments uh, on the formation of the Royal Australian Navy? Uh, yes, so uh, I think uh, uh, the, um, the f process of, form of the formation of the Royal Australian Navy shows uh, that uh, back and forth in bo on both sides. So uh, even though the British didn't want, it, uh, didn't want a, a local navy at the beginning of the 20th century, they, ch they changed uh, their mind uh, towards an Australian Navy uh, over the years and even, uh, and even came up with, uh, with uh, offers um, uh, to, to create an Australian Navy. And um, on the Australian hand, uh, we saw or we see that uh, the Australians wanted their own Navy but um, and on some points they uh, uh, went a step back and realized, well, we, we, we need more time, we need more money, we need more resources to get a, an, an own navy. And uh, they were even keen, um, they were even tough enough to reject uh, the offer of the Admiralty in 1907. So uh, it's a very interesting process. And in the end, uh, this process led to an Australian Navy. Thanks, Tim. Sadly, that's all we have time for. Uh, my thanks to James, to David and uh, Tim from Hamburg in Germany. Uh, thanks for your insights uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to your company for our next episode and bye for now.